honor and glory. I want the anointing of God. Oh, come. That's the power of God on your abdomen. That's the power of God on you. That's the power of God on you. There was a time in which God called you to do something and you lingered. You didn't respond. I know. I missed that one. I know that. It grieved the Holy Spirit. Can I ask you a question? Yes. Will you do it again? No. I will follow him. I make a mistake, now I know. I will follow him. Your answer has been heard in heaven. Amen. You've been trying too hard with God. He loves you. You've been trying to impress him. I do. I do. I want to please him. But he loves you. Amen. He created you. Amen. He loves you just like you are. Be free. You don't need to impress him. He's your daddy. What do you feel happening, sister? Hey, what do you feel happening? I can't stop it. And that's the mighty power of Jesus Christ. You know, and the Father said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And the Holy Spirit descended like a dove. See, the Holy Spirit's descended like a dove on this lady she's all trembling under the power of God it's a confirmation of the prophecy she's a daughter of the father she has a daddy who loves her and she doesn't need to impress him amen turn to the person beside you and say you don't need to impress God he loves you amen have some more sis Praise God. That's the mighty power of Jesus Christ going through her. Praise the Lord. Praise God. She'll never be the same again. Amen. We have some understanding of how to relate to people. The Holy Spirit is not a human being. So how do you relate to the Holy Spirit? Okay. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Christ. He's not a human being. He does not think like a human being. He does not act like a human being. He is God. Okay? And he responds to people in a way that's different, perhaps, than other people will respond to you. So how do you relate to the Holy Spirit? Okay? Jesus Christ is real. He's not a, a religious, historical person, although he lived, God became man. But he is, he is real, he is alive, and everything that he said is true. People dishonor the Holy Spirit because they do not believe in Jesus Christ to such an extent that they would honor him as he expects to be honored. Come on, we're going to go deeper tonight, all right? I want to talk to us about the church and people's attitudes towards the Holy Spirit. So let, let me give an example of where I'm going. In, in, uh, in a recent meeting, a man rocks up before the meeting begins and he says pray for me I want the anointing pray for me I want the I want an impartation he wants the anointing now what is the anointing 
Acts 10, 38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power. He wants the Holy Spirit to come in power in his life so that he can bless others, I assume. I want the anointing. He said, I can't, I won't be in the meeting tonight, so pray for me now. I said, sir, we're busy before the meeting begins. So afterwards I found out, we, we, fortunately they had double glazed windows, but we had this rock concert going on next door. And afterwards I found out that he'd gone to the rock concert. He wanted to be prayed for early because he was going to the rock concert. There's something wrong there. Does anyone know what it is? He was walking in the way of the world while wanting the power of God. To receive in an ongoing way the anointing in your life, you have to walk in the spirit and not walk in the flesh. So I, I want, this is very important. I'm not just talking to you people, but I'm talking to uh, hundreds and hundreds of people who watch on YouTube. Okay? That there is a way of honouring the Spirit of God that brings him to you. And when he comes, in the name of Jesus Christ, every blessing of heaven is yours. But when we grieve the Holy Spirit, it's not like, you know, if you're grieved by someone, you might take offence at what they do. He's, he doesn't do that. He's God. He's righteous. He doesn't get offended at you, but he lifts his presence. He lifts his presence. That he's grieved. Okay? He's grieved. But the Bible talks about grieving the Spirit, and it talks about resisting the Holy Spirit. Okay? And they're two different things. Two different things. To resist the Holy Spirit is dangerous. It shows a hardness of heart and can bring the judgment of God. To grieve the Holy Spirit uh, means that he, you're walking in the flesh, you know, you, you're being stubborn and so on, and he removes his felt presence from your life. He removes his hand of blessing off your life. He, he's been grieved by you. Okay? And uh, so we're going to watch a video clip of a guy in a recent meeting. And he's located by the Holy Spirit. And he says he wants to serve God. Right? But watch what, through prophecy, the Lord reveals that he was grieving the Holy Spirit and that because he had grieved the Holy Spirit, his life was going nowhere. It was, it was stuck like he was chained. It was going nowhere. Let's, let's see what the Holy Spirit says to him. Basically, we grieve the Holy Spirit when we fail to honour the Word of God and what it says in our lives. Because, why don't we honour it? Because we don't think it matters. We don't believe that, you know, we, that it matters with God. That we can just, but God sees everything and knows everything. So let, let's watch this clip. The, the clip's preaching themselves, okay? Ray, what do you want from Jesus? I want to show that Jesus, I've been waiting for him. I'm waiting. I'm waiting. I'm surrendering my life to him. I want him to reveal to me what he wants me to do. Yes. Okay. Praise God. <coughs> Just relax. Praise God. That's, that's the glory of God around you. Okay, that's the glory of God around you. Do you have a brother? Yes. How do you get on with him? Um, I haven't been spoken to him for a long time. How long? Um, maybe about 15, 16 years now. 
So you're saying that you want to serve God. Mm -hmm. I'm seeing your brother. I'm hearing the Holy Spirit saying, that's my will, be reconciled. Yes. So go to your brother and be reconciled. Amen. And then your life will begin. Thank you. Your broken relationship with your brother yes. is what hindered your life. Mm. Your life's not going anywhere. Yes. Yes. It's because of the broken relationship. So you need to go humble yourself. And God will bring love. Thank you. Okay? Yes. You got the answer to your question. You want to serve God? What does the Bible say? Reconciliation. Amen? Amen. Sometimes we want to do some great work for God. And he's saying, well... You need to show love. You need to forgive. Amen? So I'm, not, I'm just using that as an example how we can grieve the Holy Spirit. And sometimes it hinders our prayer life. That we're crying out to God for things, but we, we are grieving the Holy Spirit by the way that we act. Praise God. So uh, let, let's start with this idea of resisting the Holy Spirit. Resisting the Holy Spirit is when we set ourselves against his will. Now, the anointing, because some people uh, in this ministry, we, we get people who um, really oppose the anointing. The anointing is the manifest love of God. Think of that. The anointing is God's love for people in power by the Holy Spirit, healing, delivering, making them well. I could tell you so many stories. I could tell you a story of Joy Newcomb, 13 years housebound from paranoid schizophrenia in Texas this year. 13 years, couldn't go out, couldn't even go on the balcony. If she saw someone coming, she'd run back in. Uh, cirrhosis, psoriasis of the uh, the liver, liver disease, colonitis, stomach disease, deaf in one ear. And she said, "I want to meet Jesus." She got on a train for two days, too afraid to fly. She travelled two days, having panic attacks, being with people for two days. She came to the meeting, and she met with Jesus. The anointing healed her. She just messaged me the other day, that was months ago, she said I'm, I'm still doing well. Deaf ear opened, liver was healed, colonitis was healed, she used to swell like she was pregnant, all the, the mental illness gone. She said to me that she was off her medication, the anointing. But at the end of that meeting a lady came up and she had like demonic fire in her eyes and she let loose and about the anointing. A dangerous thing to resist the anointing because you resist the love of God. And that love for people is like a consuming fire to resist the Holy Spirit. So Jesus was talking to the scribes and Pharisees who resisted what he was doing, didn't want him to heal in the synagogues. And he said this, Matthew twenty one forty two, Have you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone? This was the Lord's doing and it is marvellous in our eyes. Therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you. Wow. Talking to these religious people. The kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation. That's us, the church. Given to a nation, bearing the fruits of it. And whoever falls on this stone will be broken. And on whomever it falls, it will grind him to powder. That's the anointing. The same anointing that brings healing is Jesus Christ. He is the rock. 
you fall upon that rock, you oppose that rock, and you will be broken. But if that rock, that anointing turns on you, it'll grind you to powder. Amen? Ah, oh, come on. This is not the message that you normally hear in church, is it? We're selective in what we say. I remember I was at a meeting when I was a missionary, and they were talking in Guarani. I always found Guarani impossible. I speak Spanish, but Guarani was indigenous language, national, very tribal language. So this guy comes in and he's yelling at the pastor and he's carrying on and, you know, in front of all the church and everything. So what happens? Goes out within two days. Uh, I can't remember who it was, but I think his wife dropped dead and he had a major stroke. I remember I was... Um, uh, uh, when I was working in an organisation, the head of the organisation said to me, Mark, we don't want you sharing any testimonies in your newsletter. Now, the Bible in the Psalms says that we are to proclaim his marvellous works. We don't want you talking about healing, you know. So what happened to him? Well, not long after, he lost his position I don't know how that happened. And within two years, he dropped dead. You know, if that stone should come upon you, grind you. And, and today we have people who resist the Holy Spirit, but in a very subtle way. But God knows the heart. I remember a pastor saying to me, oh yes, we believe in healing. We're Pentecostals. You know, that's part of our doctrine. But uh, it's not something we would focus on. And where's his church at today? They're, they're selling fairy floss to try to pay the rent. Another man, another pastor said to me, well, he said, uh, we don't want the words of knowledge and prophecy and we don't want you emphasising healing. Just have an inspiring message. Just have an inspiring message and if people want to come up and pray, they can, they can pray. Where is he today? Church is scattered, he's not a pastor. People who resist the anointing don't know what they're resisting. They're resisting the love of God for other people. You do not enter the kingdom of heaven, Jesus said, and you hinder those who are seeking to enter. And you know, God is a consuming fire. He's a fire of love for people. He wants people to know his love. He wants people to be delivered and set free and healed and to come against his will is to resist the Holy Spirit. Praise God. So grieving the Spirit of God, uh, how do we grieve the Holy Spirit? Well, Hebrews 3, verse 7, we, we can grieve the Holy Spirit simply by unbelief. You see, the Word of God and the Holy Spirit are inseparable. It is the sword of the Spirit. It's, it's the weapon that he uses. Jesus said, my words are spirit and life. When you speak the word of God by the direction of the Holy Spirit, he comes. It cannot be separated. You cannot separate the word of God from the spirit. So when, when people harden their hearts and choose not to believe the word, they grieve the Holy Spirit. They grieve the Holy Spirit. Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. You see, without faith, you cannot please God. That's what Paul says in the book of Hebrews. And without faith, it is impossible to please God. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists 
and that he is the rewarder of those who seek him. And how do we believe? But faith comes by hearing and hearing by the preaching of Christ, preaching of the word of God, you see? So in our relationship with the Holy Spirit, we need to understand what grieves him, what is resisting his will, and understand what pleases him. We please him by surrendering our hearts and lives to the reality and truth of the word of God. Mm. You said it, Lord, I believe it. You said not to do it, I won't do it. Mm. See, in the church today, the church is making up its own value system about sexuality, for example, of what is right or wrong. And they're disregarding what the word says. In so doing, they are grieving the Holy Spirit. In fact, what's coming into the church today is what Paul calls the doctrine of demons. The doctrine of demons. The word of God has been established in heaven. Cannot be changed by man. It's established in heaven. It's the eternal word of God. It existed before our century. It will exist after this generation has gone. It's the eternal word of God. So we are here as a church to preach the word, to believe the word, to honour the word. And in so doing, we honour the precious Holy Spirit. Amen. Praise God. So... Um, The Holy Spirit's grieved in the life of the Christian through hypocrisy. That's when we claim to be a Christian, but we walk in the flesh. We, we go to church with a smile on our face, but inside there's another thing going on. I remember in the great outpouring of the Holy Spirit in Melbourne in about 1997, at a place called Christchurch Dingley. I was there as, as an assistant pastor before the outpouring of the Spirit. They had 35,000 people come. You can read about it on, on the web. Over 18 months, 35,000 people came to this church. But I was there before it happened. And I remember uh, some of the prophecies before this outpouring. And uh, these were, it was unusual because like you get two people standing up in the church and both would have the same word, the same prophecy. And one of them was, take off your religious mask. Take off your religious mask. See, the Holy Spirit knows exactly who you are. Exactly what's in your heart. What you're thinking. Even before you say the word, he knows what you're going to say. And uh, it's not unusual for people, you know, before they have the opportunity to say what they want to say, <laughs> power of God falls on them and heals them, you know, because he knows all things. Amen? He's such a loving God. And he wants our Christian walk to be one of integrity, that what is in our hearts and what is in our personal lives is the same as what you see on the outside, that there's this correspondence between heart and action. Amen? Amen. Praise God. Now, the, oftentimes the churches grieve the Holy Spirit. Many times people say to me, why don't we see miracles and God moving in power in the church today? Because one reason is the church, even without knowing it, is grieving the Holy Spirit. How are we grieving the Holy Spirit? Well, leaders say things like, we allow the Holy Spirit to move in our church. That's like saying we allow our pet dog to come into the house. Is that right? I mean, get over yourself. We're talking about Jesus Christ, the Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, the Saviour of the world, 
who bought the church with his blood, it belongs to him, who is the head of the church, the foundation, the cornerstone of the church, and we say to him, well, you can have five minutes to do something, but 95% is our time. And the church is grieving the Holy Spirit by controlling what's going on. The church does not belong to leaders. The church belongs to Jesus Christ. He bought it with his own blood. He is the God of his church. He loves his people and it belongs to him. Praise God. So, you know, if a church invites me and says, you only have this amount of time, I say, well, I can't come. Because it's not for me to put a time thing on God. Times and seasons belong to the Holy Spirit. And when God is moving, we say, Lord, this is your, this is your church, this is your meeting. Do as, as you will. Amen. Amen. I was uh, preaching in Auckland and, uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, this happened and I got, uh, well, I got up to preach and um, the Holy Spirit wouldn't let me preach. He just wouldn't let me preach. He said, go down the back and pray for that lady, lady down there. She needs deliverance. And I, I, I can't preach. So, oh, Lord. so I went down the back and said to a lady, oh, the Holy Spirit's located you. I can't preach, so we've got to get this done so I can preach. And you need deliverance. And uh, so she stood up, power of God fell on her, she started screaming and, and uh, kicking chairs and uh, all, <laughs> it, all, it was all happening, got totally delivered, totally changed, transformed her life and uh, I just saw her the other day, she's like a happy smiling person delivered of this evil spirit. So I turn to go back and preach, I think well I can go and preach now. You see it's the master's meeting. And we, the pastors, or whatever we are, whatever we call ourselves, are servants of the master. We don't tell the master you can have five minutes to move. We honour the master. We seek to please the master and not to grieve the Holy Spirit. So I turn and he says, you're not finished yet. That lady over there has a tumour in, in her breast and it's dangerous and it needs to be removed now. And she says, yes, that's true. <laughs> Power of God goes through and removes it. Then he says, now you can preach. <laughs> Praise God. It's because people don't believe that the master is in the room. Just because he's not seen doesn't mean he's not there. Amen. And we need to honour him, love him, seek him with all our heart. All that we have belongs to him. Honour the presence of Jesus Christ in the church and let him do whatever he wants. Because the church today, many churches are like the old synagogues. You know? You've got six days to do your healing, but this is the Sabbath. Don't heal on the Sabbath. You know? Don't you do this stuff in the church. And we, we grieve the Holy Spirit when we do this. We need to honour the Lord. The Lord Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today and forever. He's still healing, delivering, saving, sanctifying. You know? John the Baptist said, Behold, one is coming whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. He will baptise you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Have you ever seen someone baptised in fire? Wow. This lady... Um, in Fiji, I think it was, Fiji, yeah, this year. The power of God comes on her and she's, she's asleep. You can watch, watch it on YouTube. She's asleep. And uh, I place my, head, my hand on her head. Her husband's beside her, asleep. They're out. I said to her, I hear a baby crying. I hear a baby crying. Well, I'm talking to her, she's in heaven. And she's begging God, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me for my abortion. And she can hear me. I can hear a baby crying. I can hear a baby crying. And the master says, my daughter, go in peace. Three years of guilt, gone, peace. 
Then she comes back two or three days later, Sunday. She says, pray for me. Okay. The power of God falls on her. The fire of God falls and she starts screaming like she's burning in hell. And she's just burning and screaming. You know, just at the top of her lungs, screaming, burning, I'm burning, I'm burning. And then it stopped and she said, I feel so light. I said, that's because all the heaviness is burnt up in your life. Amen. I mean, what Jesus said is true. Praise God. We all need a good burning. Amen. Everything that, you know, when they, when they took st gold and silver and stuff, all these treasures, they used to uh, pass the gold through fire. Praise God. Put your hand on your chest and say, Lord, pass me through fire. Amen. He's, our God is a consuming fire and he sanctifies by the, by the fire of Jesus Christ. Praise God. That's what our church in the world today needs, a baptism in fire. Praise God that Jesus Christ would pour out his fire on the church and people would repent of their sins. Praise God. You know, it's hard to explain, but the heart can carry rubbish. And, and when God's fire comes, it just <laughs> burns through the rubbish. People need to repent. Often they need deliverance. They also need the fire to cleanse it out. And the mind doesn't understand, but it's true. It's a spiritual truth. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. You know... Um, your mind, your natural mind, is also referred to as the carnal mind or the natural mind. Now, the natural mind does not understand the things of the spirit, the Bible says. Nor can it perceive them, for they are spiritually discerned. So what happens is, when the natural mind does not understand what's going on, if you're not careful, your natural mind will grieve the Holy Spirit because your natural mind will take offence at what it doesn't understand. If I was to spit and put it on someone's eyes, some of you would be offended. But that's what Jesus did. He spat and anointed blind men's eyes. Praise God. And so the natural mind has this propensity because it wants to understand to take offence. And when it takes offence, often it will reveal the heart. God's not interested particularly in you understanding, but in you trusting and obeying. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. See, there are two types of people. There's a spiritual person who spiritually discerns what's going on. And there's a carnal person who doesn't have a clue and judges things. Paul says, I'm rightly judged by no man. Praise God. Boy, that'll make you think. I'm rightly judged by no man because... He knew who he was in Christ. He was a spiritual man. Paul says, I could not speak to you as spiritual people, but as babes. The carnal people. The carnal people. I had a man come up to me in Auckland, and I could tell there was something wrong, and he, he starts talking to me, asking questions, and I said to him, well, sir, I don't want to respond to your natural mind. These things are spiritual. He said, oh, okay. And then, then he says, and why isn't everyone healed? I said to him, sir, if I was to give you the answer, you wouldn't understand because it's a spiritual answer. The natural mind. Praise God. Hallelujah. 
just finishing up, when was Jesus really angry? Do you remember? When was he angry? In the temple. Why was he angry? They were doing the wrong thing in his house, weren't they, sister? You have made my father's house a place of merchandise. Greed offends and grieves the Holy Spirit. Because the Spirit of God is the Spirit of generosity. Freely you have received, freely give. And Paul says that the children, he's talking about finances, children do not lay up for the parents, but the parents for the children. So when Paul would come to a place, he would lay up in himself the treasures of heaven to bless the children, spiritual children. But today in the church, we see leaders who, who are seeking money out of the church, seeking what they can gain out of the church. It grieves the Holy Spirit. Grieves the Holy Spirit. And do you know, if you trust God, he will abundantly supply all of your needs. The leaders in the church should be storing up the riches of heaven to bless people. Amen? And not seeking what they can get out of people. Because otherwise you're working in the spirit of greed rather than the spirit of generosity. Amen? God has called us to be a blessing to many. I remember uh, when I was in Paraguay, it was about 1996, I was, I've stretched out my hand to, well, to, I think, to go out the front door. I was going to go somewhere. I don't remember what I was doing. And as I was about to leave the house, the power of God fell on me like a tornado. And I lost control of my body and I began to spin so that everything became a blur. And as I'm spinning, I'm taken into a vision. And in the vision, I'm holding a cup of water. And in the vision, I'm twirling very fast and the cup of water under centrifugal force. You know what the law of centrifugal force was spinning the water everywhere. And the Holy Spirit said to me, freely you have received, freely give. And it was like I couldn't control my giving. <laughs> Amen? I'll never forget that. I was just, just going to go out of the house. <sighs> freely you have received, freely give. Praise God. God is a God who gives. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son praise God and just to finish you know, unforgiveness grieves the Holy Spirit because Jesus Christ died on the cross to forgive and if we have been forgiven such a great debt who are we to hold unforgiveness Amen praise God So, can I ask you some questions, uh, yeah, Jim? Certainly. So, what was your experience in the church where, you know, where the power of God was moving? Well, I didn't get saved. I had a very radical uh, conversion. Mm -hmm. I didn't get saved in a church. I never went to church. I never read the Bible. I never recall my father and mother going to church except for weddings and funerals. Mm -hmm. So, I could say that I came out of a unchristian family and I went my own sinful ways and I just went right through life I never got saved until I was 61 61? Yes And you are now? 90 in January Praise God, give the Lord a clap And I never got saved in a church uh -huh. and I never was spoken to by an evangelist or anything like that. I got saved in a bus shelter okay. in far north Queensland. And our, I maintain that you can come to church, you can say a sinner's prayer, but your nut doesn't get you saved. 
The only thing that gets you saved, as far as I'm concerned, is a revelation from God himself. Amen. And in that bus shelter, I met Jesus. I picked up a little track that was lying on the, on the ground, and I picked it up and I thought, well, Jehovah's Witnesses or something like that. And it said, what must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, thou shalt be saved, thou and thy household. And at that moment, I burst out crying for no apparent reason. I profusely cried. And the tears just kept coming. And all the time, I could hear a voice in my head speaking to me and saying, this is not the way to go. And that's when I got saved in that bus shelter. I had nothing at all to do with church or anything else. Okay. But then, after that, we went to a church and it turned out to be a Pentecostal church. Okay. I didn't know what that meant. But, but when I got there, it was just like this. Uh -huh. people so this were is like 30 years ago. Yes, people were singing and praising the Lord. And people were getting healed. And it was, it was wonderful. That was the church that I wanted. But over the years now, 28 years later, the church has gone to pot, as far as I'm concerned. The modern church has lost the plot. They have got an issue with the blood. They've got an issue with the cross. And all they want to do now is furry lights, smoke, and noise, and a lot of nonsense. And that's not church. This is church. This is church. This is what we want. And this is what I wanted to tell you. I have got a revelation which only occurred to me in the last eight or nine years. Jesus Christ is the source of all blessings. Amen. And the cross is the means by which the blessings come. Amen. And if the cross isn't the object of your faith, you have failed miserably and you will never enter the gates of heaven. Amen. You have to feature on the cross and what Jesus did on that cross. Because if Jesus had not gone to the cross... The whole world, past, present, and future, was going straight to hell. Amen. So this is what we need. We need Amen. the church to be revived again. Amen. Amen. Jim, churches today talk about culture, church culture. They say we, we have our church culture. And it's actually a philosophy of demons. Because the word of God and the gospel is eternally established in the heavens. And the kingdom of heaven has its own culture. Amen. That culture is the word of God. That's right. It is unchanging. 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 Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jim, one of the reasons why I got you up was because I had this passion for the church. Amen. And I want to see the church come to an encounter with the living Lord Jesus Christ. Well, we've had a promise from Jesus. He said, in these last days, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh and your sons will have visions and your daughters will prophesy. Amen. And old men like me will have dreams. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. 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 You know, uh, there's this concept that, you know, well, the older generation, they did it that way, but we have our way of doing it now. It's rubbish, isn't it? <laughs> you know, I mean, Jesus Christ died on the cross. His blood avails and continues to avail and will continue to avail mm -hmm. from generation to generation. Amen. That's amen. Yes, I believe that entirely. But God said something that we must never forget. Mm -hmm. Jesus said it. Who is God anyway? Yeah. I will build my church and amen. the gates of hell will not <laughs> prevail against it. <laughs> Amen, amen. Bless you, Jim. Praise God, praise God, praise God. Hallelujah.